Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Now, live and direct from the press box at Old Comiskey Park, it's time for when football was football. Let's join your host, Joe Ziemba, with another forgotten tale from Chicago's pro football history. Let's go! There are comebacks, and then there are comebacks. In 1946, the Chicago Bears won still another championship in the National Football League under head coach and owner George Hallis. Yet this was not an ordinary year for both Hallis and the Bears. Not only did the team rebound from an ugly 3-7 finish in 1945 to conclude the next year with an 8-2-1 title-winning performance in 1946, but Hallis and many of his players literally came back from lengthy service commitments in World War II. During this episode of When Football Was Football in the Sports History Network, we'll examine how Hallis and his players were able to merge back into the NFL after their often horrific experiences during the war. How does a coach discipline a player who has encountered the challenges of modern warfare and the hopeless brutality that went along with it? And how does a coach even attempt to establish team rules for mature former soldiers who might now view the game of football as child's play after being shot at just months previously? As a child, I remembered a story my father shared with me regarding a similar situation he experienced as a young coach. In 1946, he was a high school football coach who also doubled as a junior college track coach. War veterans were encouraged to take advantage of the GI Bill, which offered them financial assistance, beginning in 1944, to pursue educational opportunities. As such, many of them decided to enroll in the college of their choice. In this case, or my father's case, it was Morgan Park Junior College on the south side of Chicago, which also offered athletic teams. For my father was a bit intimidating, although he was a big guy, a former football player, and an NFL draft choice of the Chicago Cardinals, he quickly discovered that most of the members of his track team were older than he was, due to the years they spent in the service. He also couldn't help but notice that some of the squad members displayed their own personal souvenirs of the war in the form of scars from bullet wounds or other related injuries. However, he was pleased that the team members were not only polite but also very respectful to the young coach. Still, I wondered what it must have been like for coaches all over the country to welcome back football players at any level who were savvy war vets. The NFL was flooded with veterans in 1946, and the league overflowed with a wealth of talent. This was in contrast to the lean years from 1942 through 1945, when the league stumbled courageously to survive with the lack of both players and talent. Teams like the Eagles and the Steelers combined forces in 1943 to become the Steagles, while the Steelers and the Cardinals merged in 1944 as the Card Pits, which we covered in a previous episode of When Football Was Football. Nothing was easy for the NFL during the war years. Of course, the league did survive, and the abundance of available players made the NFL much stronger across all teams after the war. But how would the spirit and the morale of the individual teams survive? Would the returning players from 1945 mingle well with the returning war vets? And would the veterans 
be receptive to the old-fashioned rules and discipline of the typical NFL team. Coach George Hellis of the Chicago Bears realized that this would be a challenge, and yet he was quite certain that he should probably ease up on his own stringent team regulations. Hellis wrote in his autobiography, Having been in the service 39 months, I knew my veterans would be fed up with petty regulations. When the spring training camp opened, I announced all rules were scrapped. Bears were men, responsible men, self-disciplined men, and would look after themselves. Hellas clearly adopted a hands-off policy when it came to team rules in 1946, but he had also been a stickler for players dressing and behaving in a first-class manner when the team traveled. Perhaps he was a bit surprised when he asked the team to assist him with guidelines for team travel attire. He said, At a team meeting I asked, how do you fellas suggest we dress for traveling as a team? Someone said, I think we should all wear shirts and jackets. Mm, fine, gentlemen, I said. Will we all wear shirts and jackets? Anything else? Someone said, a tie? More a question than a fact. Thank you for the excellent suggestion, I said. Is it agreed we all wear ties? More a fact than a question. There was silence in the room. Fine, I said, it is all agreed. We will all wear shirts and ties and jackets, and I assume you gentlemen all insist that shoes will be well shined. So that's how Hellas handled attire in the post-World War II era. And so it was that George Hellas managed to maneuver around two of his major concerns when dealing with mature and world-weary war veterans returning to the Chicago Bears. He simply discarded his previous team rules and then wisely decided to allow the players to determine their own dress code. His main challenge, however, remained. Would he be able to build a competitive football team from a core of holdovers from 1945, some wide-eyed rookies, and a solid group of proven war veterans? In fact, when Hallis opened up his training camp at St. Joseph's College in Indiana on August 6, 1946, there were 14 rookies invited to the festivities, along with a solid group of war veterans. The Chicago Tribune covered the squad on an almost daily basis, but offered no predictions for the upcoming season. It said, it's too early to say whether these 1946 Bears, most of whom have been away to war for two or three years, still had the physical resources to regain their pre-war position as pro football's number one team. If Hallis expected his war vets to return as cynical or uncaring, just the opposite seemed to be occurring in the early days of the camp, where everyone struggled with two practices each day in the withering Hoosier heat. However, the players themselves, led by quarterback Sid Luckman and center Bulldog Turner, kept the squad out for even more drills, especially focusing on the beloved T formation that Hallis preferred. One evening after finishing his third practice of the day, 28-year-old fullback Bill Osmanski, a Navy veteran who saw action in the Pacific, said, I've been wanting to do this for a long time, just to get in there and work alongside Sid Luckman, George, and Bulldog and the others. Don't worry about us. We've got a lot of good football left. And so Hallis was pleased with that extra effort stating, they have a building in spirit. We'll put a pre-war team on the field. Of course, the competition is greatly improved. Every team is loaded with players of proven ability, not merely promising youngsters. We may not win, but I wouldn't want the job of convincing the Bears that they can't win. And remember when we mentioned that Hellas tossed aside his normal team rules out of respect for the veterans on the team? In previous years, Alice would banish any weight challenge players to something called the Fat Men's Table in an effort to help that player lose some of that off-season extra poundage. This really was not needed for the 1946 Bears, although a few like Bill Osmanski put themselves in that category, even if it was not necessarily needed. The Tribune reported, the 210-pound Osmanski demonstrated just how determined the old bears are by voluntarily taking a place at the fat man's table. 
Although he's only 10 pounds overweight, which isn't much, that meant Bill dined on steak, beets, cauliflower, and dry toast. But his self-control wavered when the French fried potatoes went by. He said, I was wondering. What? asked the rest of the fat men. Well, if I could just have another half cup of tea, Bill finished. In its preseason preview, the Philadelphia Inquirer predicted a quick return to normal for Hallis and the Bears. It said, for the Bears once more are the Bears. The most formidable team in modern history of football is back to its old pre-war self. 19 members of the 1940 through 43 juggernauts have returned from the war and the old coach is back at the controls. Few coaches would be able to restrain a joyous yelp or two at the sight of the human pachyderms and greyhounds, especially if, like Hallis, they could feel all this was their very own. No one tried rookies, these, but huskies of proven merit. Among the 19 players Hellas welcomed back fresh from warfare were crafty halfback George McAfee, returning from extended service in the Navy, Chicago dentist Bill Osmansky, mentioned previously, and Ken Cavanaugh, who played briefly in 1945 after successfully flying 32 missions over Germany as a pilot and being awarded with the Distinguished Flying Cross. Former All-Pro tackle Joe Steidehar, a gunner lieutenant in the Navy, whose crew was credited with sinking two German submarines, and tackle Bill Hempel, a PT boat commander who helped sink six Japanese ships. There were others, of course, who were anxious to return to football and forget the horrors of real-life battle. It was the keen responsibility of Coach George Hallis to mix in the old with the new and create a football squad that possibly could contend for NFL championship honors. Back in 1946, the NFL schedule began much later than it does now. Prior to the opening contest at Green Bay on September 29th, the Bears managed five comfortable exhibition game wins. Hallis was generous with playing time for rookies and others fighting for a roster position. It seemed that at times Hallis realized the extent of the talent on his club and was reluctant to showcase his star players. For example, in one preseason outing, elusive halfback McAfee was limited to just five minutes on the field. Then, for the opener against Green Bay, Hellas secretly held McAfee out of the game to allow a nagging leg muscle to heal. The loss of McAfee failed to hinder the Bears, however, as the Packers fell easily 30-7. Luckman tossed a pair of touchdown passes in the first half as the Bears opened up a 17-0 lead. Hellas played ball control during those two opening periods as the Bears ran off 45 plays compared to just 19 for the Packers. And so the season progressed for the Bears, rolling up an 8-2-1 record to capture the NFL Western Division by two games over the Los Angeles Rams. This allowed the Bears to face the Eastern champion New York Giants for the NFL crown on December 15th. The Bears were on a roll, although the Giants captured the only meeting between the two clubs, 14-0, on October 27th. It was a horrendous experience for quarterback Sid Luckman, who recalled that outing to the New York Daily News before the title game in December by saying, Let's not talk too much about it. What a terrible day I had. Five interceptions by New York or something, among other things was the first win by the Giants over the Bears since 1939, and New York grabbed the Eastern Division title with a 7-3-1 record. Despite the win in October, the Bears were favored in the championship match, which did not bother Giants coach Steve Owen, who said, That's all right with us. My boys certainly won't be hoodwinked into overconfidence by these figures. But the day belonged to Luckman and the Bears as the Chicagoans survived the Giants 24-14 as Luckman threw a scoring pass to Kent Cavanaugh in the first half, then ran 19 yards for the winning points in the final period. The latter play caught the Giants and everyone among the record crowd of about 60,000 by surprise. For Luckman, you see, had only rushed once previously during the long season and that effort against the Cardinals was more of a scramble to stay alive than anything else. This time it was a play called Bingo Keep It. 
It was such a shock to Luckman when the play was called that he ran over to Hallis during a penalty walk-off to confirm. The result was successful, but never a work of art as reported by the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, which said, Sid took a lot of kidding about that 19-yard lope. He didn't look pretty, something like a runaway steam shovel hitting tough bumps. But he did lug and shove, push and bounce the whole piece, with the aid of a 240-pound assistance from Ray Bray, who blotted out the Giants' last man. And so, George Hellis did the unthinkable. Turn a woe-begone team into a group of champions in just one season. It was the Bears' fourth title during the 1940s, but would be the team's last until 1963. Yet it will be remembered as the year when an aging coach took a bunch of battle-hardened war veterans, wisely disregarded his own rules, and led the club to a well-earned NFL championship. Thank you for joining us on this episode of When Football Was Football. And please return for our next one, where we're going to talk about the five players who have had their jerseys retired by the Arizona Cardinals, including one player that history has largely forgotten. Thank you. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One Gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row 1 catalog and for gallery prints and gift items, plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row 1 Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes.